find my rest without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my heart Lord I need Sin runs deep, your grace is more, the grace is found, is where you Temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all.
in me from life's first cry to final breath jesus commands my destiny change to
morning, everybody. From Mid Lake Shore. Uh, some of you might be asking, where is Alicia? Who is this dude up here? Um, Alicia, our leader, is taking a very well earned week of rest, and we are supporting her as best we can. So, right now, I ask you all to stand and join us as we uh, worship our Lord this morning.
morning, church. It is good to be in God's house today, and today we're going to talk a little bit about King David. And in perhaps one of his most famous songs that he wrote, he said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We often associate this psalm with something that you read at memorial services or funerals as peace and hope to those who have lost someone, but this is a psalm for the living. This is a psalm that reminds us, regardless of the circumstances that we walk through to get to this place, we serve a Lord who is our shepherd, and we fear no evil. That not only is he taking care of us in present day, he has a plan for a hope and a future to take care of us all the days of our life until we join him in heaven. Let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, we give you this time this morning. May we open our minds and our hearts to what you have for us today. May we acknowledge you for who you are, a holy God who brings us into this place of worship. Draw close to us as we seek your face this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue in worship.
You know, we, uh, we talk a lot about freedom, uh, Americans in particular. I mean, we love to talk about being free, uh, especially over the next couple of weeks. You're going to hear a lot of talk about being free uh, as we are approaching the most important election of our lifetimes. Or maybe it was four years ago. We have trouble keeping track. But here's the thing, and here's what we celebrate in this place. We celebrate a freedom that can never be voted away, legislated away, sold or bought because we celebrate a freedom in this place, the freedom that comes from serving a Savior that defeated death. Amen. Now at 8.30, they made a little noise about that. I don't know how y'all feel about it, but we serve a Savior that defeated death, and that is the freedom that we celebrate in this place. It can't be taken away. You can't vote for it. You can't purchase it. It exists because we have an assurance in Jesus Christ who came, showed us how to live, taught and modeled a perfect way of living, died for the forgiveness of our sins, and then defeated death and rose victoriously. That's the freedom that we celebrate in this place. Let's continue in worship this morning. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a
may be seated. What's your philosophy? That's a question we started asking last week, and we asked the question uh, through the lens of the movie The Lion King, this journey of a young lion finding out about his place in the world, about his place in the circle of life, and his place as he matures into a leader. Last week, we looked at the song Hakuna Matata, a wonderful phrase, and it means no worries, which on the surface seems like a pretty good outlook to have in life, but we also realize through his interaction with the well-meaning warthog and meerkat that it also means no responsibilities, no consequences, and the past is in the past. And we looked at what the Bible says about how our past can actually shape our outlook on our present and our future. So today we're going to look at another song in The Lion King, I Just Can't Wait to Be King. How many of you have heard the song, could sing the song from memory, a couple, okay, good, great. Now, last week I showed you a clip from the movie. I showed you the song Hakuna Matata, and the problem with that is if we leave that on our website, uh, the evil empire Disney will pull it down, uh, citing copyright infringement. Just kidding, don't sue us. But uh, they don't like to leave stuff like that up. So instead, today we are going to do a partial reenactment, which you can't sue us for, of I just can't wait to be king. Now, this is uh, Simba. And uh, this is Zazu, uh, one of the king's uh, little helpers. He's a, a hornbill, okay? And Zazu is trying to train young Zimba on, you know, what it means to be a king, and he's going to have some power, he's going to have some authority, he's going to have to get married, you know, all these type of things. And Simba reacts in this way, says, I'm going to be a mighty king, so enemies beware. Of course, he says, well, I've never seen a king or beast with quite so little hair, See, it's important when you're a lion to keep the main thing the main thing. Now, some of y'all get that later, but it's hilarious, I promise. It says, I'm going to be the main event like no king was before. I'm brushing up, I'm looking down, I'm working on my roar. Thus far, a rather uninspiring thing. And he says, say it with me, I just can't wait to be king. No one's saying do this, no one's saying be there, no one's saying stop that, no one's saying see here, free to run around all day, free to do it all my way. Zazu says, I think it's time that you and I arrange the heart to heart, but see, kings don't need advice from little hornbills for a start. Says, everybody look right, look left, everywhere you look, I'm standing in the spotlight. Oh, I just can't wait to be king. Young Zimba had a lot to learn about the monarchy, a lot to learn about being a king. And today we're going to look at what it means to be a king through a couple of stories in Scripture that you're probably familiar with. But before you dismiss this as, well, this doesn't apply to me because I don't, I don't want to be a king. I don't want to be in charge of anything, right? I'm not a leader. I'm a follower. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Even if you're not in a leadership position, even if you don't aspire to be in charge, we all have preferences. And it is just human nature to try to dictate those preferences to the people around us. It's just human nature to lead people in the direction of our preferences. And sometimes this is a good thing. If you're a parent, you should probably lead your children in the direction of your preferences, at least as they are in their formative years. You will all have the opportunity, you may have already uh, taken the opportunity, you're going to dictate your preferences as to how the country should be run in a week or two because we have that right as Americans. You're gonna say, this is what I want, this is what I want. So being in charge, being in leadership is not always being the king, but we all have the opportunity to lead something or lead someone. And we're gonna look at what that looks like from a biblical perspective. We're going to look at three stories from the life of perhaps the most famous king in the Bible, the life of King David. And as we look through these stories in King David's life, I'm reminded of some of the stories that we talk about Joseph. When I preach on Joseph, as I've done a few times now, I always use the example of here's a person 
that any time they had an opportunity to respond, he took the right way. He responded in the godly fashion. And it didn't matter what was happening to him. In the worst of circumstances, man, Joseph gave the right answer. In the worst type of situations that you could be in, Joseph gave the godly response. Such cannot be said for King David. But we're going to see how his story starts. We're going to read, uh, starting in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to kind of tell these stories and highlight some verses. But the first story is the story of David and Goliath. Now, this is maybe one of the more familiar and famous stories of David's life. He was just a boy. He was 15 years old, approximately. And he had already, in 1 Samuel 16, he'd already been anointed as the future king of Israel. The prophet Samuel shows up. He looks at all of Jesse's sons. He looks at the tall ones. He looks at the strong ones. He looks at the smart ones. He says, it's none of these guys. It's David. And he anoints him as king. Israel is a constant war with the Philistines, and they have a champion. They have a giant by the name of Goliath, a man presumably upwards of nine feet tall, that could defeat all challengers. And he's taunting the Philistines. And they're looking for anyone that can step to this giant and defeat him. And David says, I'll do it. I said, no, you can't do it. You're a shepherd. You're here delivering food. You are an ancient grub hub. You do not belong on the battlefield. And he says, I'll do it. So King Saul gives him some, some armor and some weapons. He says, I, I don't need this. This stuff is uncomfortable. It's too big for me. I'll do it. And so the shepherd boy approaches this giant, and this is what he says. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45, David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistine this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with a sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Now this is bold. Here's a guy that trusts God. Here's a guy that stands up to the biggest challenge any of them have ever seen. He digs his heels in and he says, fool, I'm going to kill you till you're dead. And I'm going to parade around here with your head. And all your little buddies, the beasts of the earth, are going to feed on them because we're going to kill all of you. So that you will know. And so that they will know that there's a God in Israel. Man, that's bold. This kid. And here's the thing. He steps to the giant. You all know the story. And he kills him all the way. Not with a sword and not with armor, but with a sling and a rock. Then he takes Goliath's own sword and beheads him. And he does parade around with the head because, let's face it, the Old Testament's weird. And they defeated the Philistines on that day. And David, David becomes a folk hero in this time period. In fact, if we were to start a service back then and I said, hey guys, today we're going to talk about, you know, the, the shepherd David, the future king of Israel, the entire crowd would have cheered because he was, he was their guy, man. This was David. And he began a rocky relationship with King Saul. King Saul certainly appreciated David's valor and his military strategy and his ability to defeat Philistines, but it's also a little, a little jealousy brewing. In fact, the Bible tells us the people of the day, they used to sing a song, a song that King Saul absolutely loved, that said, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. La, 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 la. And King Saul loved it when they sang that song. So a little jealousy started brewing up, and it didn't help that David became extremely close friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. They formed this, this close friendship, this bond. The jealousy was so bad that at one point, actually at two separate points, King Saul chucked a spear at David, 
in the middle of dinner, like you do. And so David did what anybody would do who was hated by someone else. He married his daughter. David marries King Saul's daughter, and that did not help. Because now King Saul is jealous of David's success, and his daughter loves him, and his son has a friendship with him. But King Saul was figuring it all out. He said, you know, I don't need to kill David. I'll let the Philistines do it. So he kept sending David out on these, on these army missions, on these, these special ops, on essentially these suicide missions. He would tell them, again, the Old Testament, it's a different time and place. He's, I need you to go defeat so many Philistines. I need you to bring me 100 foreskins of the Philistines, because that's how they kept track, apparently, which is gross. Um, but David would come back with 200, because he was a mighty man of valor, and that did not help things. King Saul's jealousy turned to hatred, and, and he, he hated David, and he hated his daughter for loving David. He hated his son for loving David. In fact, one time the Bible tells us over dinner, King Saul would point to his son Jonathan and say, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman which this is dinner. The odds of that perverse and rebellious woman being on his other side were pretty likely. And it should come as no surprise that King Saul also chucked a spear at his son Jonathan because at this point it's just become habit. But here's a story. Man, the, the kind of king that I would aspire to be, right? He wasn't even king yet, and David dug his heels in and said, I'm doing this because God is with us. I'm doing this not because you've offended me, but because you've offended God. And the Lord is on our side. Such was the case with the story of David and Goliath. There's another story a few chapters later in 1 Samuel 21, and David is on the run. He's basically a fugitive running from Saul. They're on again. They're off again. And it's the story of David and Ahimelech. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 21, David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling, and said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? See, David was a hero. David was a man of valor. He had David's mighty men. He would have traveled with a thousand folks, a couple hundred folks at least. And he shows up at the tabernacle with no one, maybe looking like he hasn't slept in days with a wild look in his eye because he's running from the king. Now, David had an opportunity here, an opportunity to tell the truth, let the priest know what was going on. But instead, he said this. David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. So David lies to the king, and it, it's not even a good lie. He, tell, he tells the priest, I'm on a secret mission from the king. Yeah, yeah, the king. And it's a super secret mission, and it's so secret that, like, nobody knows about it, uh, not even my men. Uh, and it's a secret place. I can't, I can't tell you where the place is. That's a secret, too. But I'm on this super secret mission that no one knows about. David lied to a priest. In fact, he lied to a priest within striking distance, within viewing distance of where the tablets that say, hey, don't do that, would have been sitting because they would have had the Ten Commandments right there. He says, verse 3, Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. The priest answered, David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is only holy bread. So now, uh, the king's son-in-law showing up uh, hungry just didn't make a lot of sense because the king's son-in-law would have been fed, and he shows up, he looks like he hasn't slept in days, and like, he got anything to eat. And the priest says, well, we don't, we don't have any food. We have holy bread or consecrated bread. Now, it would have been the tradition of the tabernacle. The priests would get up every morning, and they would bake bread, and they would set it out. It was an act of worship and an act of honor to God. And it would stay out, and then the next day, the priests are very specific people, ceremonially clean, consecrated. They could eat it, but nobody else could eat it. And David, certainly in this place in his life, uh, 
would not have been considered consecrated in order to eat that bread. But he takes it and he eats it. Now that we kind of gloss over that and pass over that, but but in, in his faith and in his culture, that was such a big thing for him to eat consecrated bread when he wasn't supposed to. But he was he was scared and he was on the run and he was living a lie. Then David said to Ahimelech, this is verse eight, have you not here a, a spear or a sword at hand? For I brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. So not only does the king's son-in-law, David, show up hungry, he shows up, David, the mighty man of valor, the mighty man who delivered 200 Philistines, 1,000 Philistines, whatever the king requested, shows up and he doesn't have a weapon. This would have been extremely peculiar. And he lies again. He's like, oh, yeah, this mission was so super secret and so quick that I left without my sword, which just doesn't make any sense. At this time period, everyone would have had a sword. In fact, the only person that wouldn't have had a sword was the priest. But the priest tells him, he says, yeah, I, we don't have any weapons here. This is a tabernacle, but we do have something here. You're actually familiar with it. We have the sword of Goliath. Now, presumably, David would have had this sword after he defeated Goliath so many years ago, and then it just would have made its way to the tabernacle as a, a commemorative piece or a spoil of war or whatever. But the sword of Goliath is in the temple. The symbol of David's greatest victory, back when he was David that could dig his heels in and say, the Lord is with me and I'm going to kill you and I'm gonna, you know, everybody's going to die because God is God, that sword is here. That sword is here face to face with you when you are at your most scared and when you're lying about why you're here. It would be a sword that was packed with memories about what he was able to accomplish when he yielded to God. What happened to David? What happened to David? This is the guy, we read it at the beginning, the guy that said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I will fear no evil. And he's scared, running, lying to a priest, eating consecrated food. David took the sword. He needed a weapon. He needed something to have. And he actually fled to Gath, which was an area in the Philistines. And if you read the original story of David and Goliath, uh, Goliath was from Gath. So he's like back at the scene of the crime kind of thing. He actually shows up to the Philistine king. He tries to enlist or make friends or whatever. And of course, they're like, David, you're, you're David. Okay, we're not, we don't, we're not going to mess with you. Uh, but before they could capture him, uh, David uh, kind of flips the script on him a little bit. And he, the Bible is awesome. You should read it. Uh, at the end of this chapter, David pretends to be crazy, which is always a good way to get out of a fight. Kids, if you're not strong enough to fight, just act a little off and nobody will mess with you. All right, so David uh, is in front of the Philistine king, and he just starts to act a little loopy. He starts kind of foaming at the mouth and, and shaking and acting crazy, and he's able to get away like that, which is, which is kind of brilliant. But the problem with the story and the problem with David's lie is that him and Ahimelech were not the only people at the tabernacle that day. Someone by the name of Doeg heard his conversation like most of the time when you eavesdrop, he only heard half the conversation. And he goes back, Doeg goes back to Saul and says, hey, David, the guy that's on the run from you, David, the guy you don't like, David, the guy who's a huge threat to your throne and your power, he has plotted with a priest. And a priest has fed him. And a priest has armed him. And a priest has prayed for him and sent him on his way. So, of course, they show up to this tabernacle, Saul and his men. They say, look, it's not like that. There's no plot against you. Uh, yeah, I prayed for David. I, I'm a priest. I pray for a living. It's what I do. Like, I mean, there's no, no harm here. Saul orders his men to kill the priests at Nob. They won't do it. They're like, oh, you can't kill a priest. That's bad juju. But Doeg does it. Doeg killed 85 priests at Nob, and then they went into the village, and they killed every man, woman, and child that was there because of Saul's jealousy, because of Saul's hatred, but really because of David's lie. What happened to this mighty man of valor who's now running scared, essentially throwing people in the wake of King Saul? 
There's one more story about King David a few chapters later. 1 Samuel chapter 25. It's the story of David and Abigail. It's a story I've shared with you before. David's living in the woods. He's living with his mighty men of valor. He has this on-again, off-again relationship, hatred with King Saul. And it was sheep shearing season. Now, the great thing about sheep shearing season is if you are a sheep shearer, sheep shearing season will tell you what kind of year you're going to have because that's when you make all of your money. So it was a good time in the sheep shearing community. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 25, verse 3, uh, there was a a sheep shearer, and his name was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. So the story goes like this, and and I would just encourage you, you, when you get home today, or sometime this week, I know we're glossing over a lot of content here, go home and read 1 Samuel 17 through 25. It's a few chapters, it's a few pages. Uh, it's the whole story from David and Goliath up to this point today. And it gives you everything that, that David went through in this kind of fugitive journey. But it says that Abigail was the discerning and beautiful, and the man was harsh and badly behaved. And what had happened was David and his mighty men, he sends some men to Nabal and says, Look, we see your guys out shearing sheep, taking care of the flocks, doing what you do. And here's the thing, over the last several weeks, over the last several months, we've been looking out for you. We've made sure no one bothered you. In fact, we haven't bothered you, okay, because we're David's men. We can do whatever we want. We haven't bothered you. We've kind of protected you from other people. So would you, in kind, maybe do us a solid? We need some supplies. We need some food. Could you help us out? And the ball says get lost. It's my sheep. It's my stuff. I don't know you. Rumor has it you're a fugitive from the king. I don't want to get involved in that. My sheep, my stuff, take a hike. And the men go back and tell David that. And David says, gentlemen, we've been to kill some folks. And so he's going to go and he's going to take everything that he wanted from Nabal and then some because he's insulted. He's like, we've, we've looked out for this guy. We've, we've done this guy a solid. He won't even throw us some food. He has plenty. It's been a good season. So they are strapping up, and they are going to go wipe out this entire community. But the Bible tells us his wife, Abigail, beautiful and discerning, loads up with a bunch of supplies, goes to David and says, look, my husband is an idiot. It's not a direct translation, but that's what it means. He's, he's full of folly, that's what the Bible says, and he doesn't know what he's doing, and it, you could kill him, or you could have mercy, you could take this stuff, all right, and it'll be fine. And David takes the rations and has mercy and calls off his men and doesn't do any harm. Now, later it says, because it was such a successful sheep shearing season, this is why you need to read the Bible. It's awesome. Because it's such a successful sheep shearing season, Nabal gets toasted later that night, gets totally drunk. And Abigail tells him what she did that, you know, hey, I gave some stuff to this guy because you're an idiot and I didn't want you to die. And he gets so sad. The Bible says he turned to stone. He was so sad. And then the Bible goes on to say that later on, the Lord struck him down, the ball died. And then it goes on later to say, and this is why you should read the Bible, that David married Abigail. So he got the stuff and he got the girl. But here's the point of that story. See, we have David, who's this mighty man of valor, the man that would dig his heels in and say, I fear no evil and I'm going to kill the giant because God is with me. That's a king. We have the running, scared, lying to a priest, David, causing the destruction and the death of hundreds. That's not a king. And then we have this story in the middle where he was certainly going to act out in self-preservation. He was certainly going to act out to take care of his own, but a beautiful, discerning woman is able to teach him a little something about compassion and mercy. 
So there's a few types of people in the world, and the, the first couple we, we, we understand, like it is just human nature. Most people are basically decent human beings uh, to repay good for good. Somebody does something good for you, I'll do something good for them. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I believe uh, the government calls it quid pro quo, which is illegal, I think, but it doesn't matter. Most people uh, repay good for good. Do unto others, that kind of thing. Uh, that's normal. Some people, we live in a broken world full of sin, some people repay good with evil. There's not much you can do about that. They're just bad people, uh, sociopaths. I mean, you do something good for them, and they will, they'll, they'll cut you out of it no matter what. They're just always going to, no matter what good happens to them, they're going to do evil in return. But there's two other types of opportunities that we have in life, and it's really the opportunity to either repay evil with evil or repay evil with good. So David had the opportunity. This guy was a jerk to him, so he had the opportunity to be a jerk back. Just bad stuff happens to me. I'm going to do bad stuff to you. And you may live in a world like this, right? It's, it, it might be the business world you live in. It might be the friends that you have, but it's kind of, I believe we call it a dog-eat-dog -dog world, right, where bad stuff happens to me, so i got to leverage that bad stuff. Bad stuff happens to other people. It might be financially. It might be relationally. But, hey, stuff happens, and that's life. And that's the philosophy of the world. I'll repay good for good. I'm not a sociopath. But I'll repay evil for evil. And that's just the way the world works, and an eye for an eye, and leaves everybody blind. But Scripture calls us to repay evil with good, which is not the philosophy of the world. Scripture calls us to, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what's been done to you, regardless of who's done wrong to you, that you're to show mercy and compassion. That is challenging. Abigail says to David, look, I know. I get it. You did a nice thing, and you went and asked what would just be presumably your fair share of doing a nice thing, and you didn't get it. So what are you going to do in return? Are you going to repay evil for evil, or are you going to repay evil for good? See, we call this do unto others thing. We call that the golden rule, but we call this, as we've called it before, the platinum rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's good. It's a good start. Golden rule. But do unto others better than they've ever done to you. Whew. That's platinum. That'll change things. One of David's more famous descendants lived out this in a very special way. When he is facing a type of death that we can never imagine, when he's facing shame, he's facing pain, Jesus is praying in a garden. In Matthew chapter 26, he says, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I think that's the part we kind of overlook in Scripture sometimes. Jesus was not a masochist. Okay? He was not looking for pain. He was not looking for death. He said, look, if it's possible, I don't want to do it. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. See, through King David, we get a lot of examples of what it looks like to be a king or certainly some of the failures of being a king. But from the king of kings, we get what kingship looks like. Complete and total surrender to the Father. And so we have to ask ourselves, because aspirations aren't bad, and goals aren't bad, and leadership is not bad. We have to ask ourselves, am I leading for myself or am I leading for others? A am I leading because, let's face it, I just like being in charge and your way is stupid? Or am I leading because this is the way I've always done it and your way is stupid? Or am I leading because I just don't like change and your way is stupid? Or are we leading for others? David did not kill Goliath because Goliath upset David. David killed Goliath because Goliath upset God. So there was always this willingness when he was operating as a king would operate, 
to put God's preferences above his own. There was always this notion in Jesus' ministry, the king of kings, to submit his power and submit his authority. Simba says, to be a king is to have the spotlight always on me. Jesus says, to be a king, we shine the spotlight away from you. He would say in Matthew 20, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's what a king does. And, and so when we posture and when we're in charge and we, when we lead, guide, and direct under our own devices, that is the least kingly thing we can do. When we say, not my will but yours, that is the most. To be in charge and to be a leader, ultimately it's so counterintuitive and it is not, it is not the philosophy of the world. But to be a leader and to be in charge and to even just kind of direct and dictate our preferences is to surrender. And say, regardless of the outcome, regardless of the consequences, I surrender to what God has for me in this situation. David and Goliath, David had to surrender his fear. That no matter what happened, he knew this was what he was supposed to do, and he was going to face a giant head on. He had to sacrifice his fear when he was fleeing Saul. And because he didn't do that, People died. With the situation with David and Nabal and Abigail, all David really had to sacrifice was his ego, right? Somebody did me wrong, and I've got to do them wrong back. So the question becomes for you to lead. And like I said at the beginning, everybody leads something, and everybody leads someone. For you to lead, for you to be a king, what is it that you have to surrender might be your fear, might be your ego, it might be this need we all have for self-preservation that I just need to be okay. What do you need to surrender? Because the most kingly statement that Jesus ever made was not my will, but yours be done. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this, this story. We thank you that examples of how to be and examples of what to avoid, both are captured in your word and both serve for our instruction. God, I pray that those of us who are charged with leadership, whether it's leadership of our family, leadership of a business, school, life, or maybe we just have a circle of influence over friends or acquaintances, God, I, I pray that we remember we are leading for others and not for ourselves. I, I pray that we don't worship at the idol of our preferences. I pray that we surrender to the ultimate authority and the ultimate will of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This lonely pilgrim land, raising strong and mighty fortresses that I alone command. But these castles I've constructed by the strength of my own hand are just temporary kingdoms on foundations made of sand. In the middle of
source of my ambition is the treasure I obtain. If I measure my successes on a scale of earthly gain, if the focus of my vision is the status I attain, my accomplishments are worthless and my efforts something that David got right sometimes. It's something that Jesus got right every time. And it's something that we have the opportunity to leave this place and get right today. What must we, sur what must we surrender to be a king, to lead, and to follow God's will? Let's stand this morning and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this day of worship giving us this place to worship. May we leave here uh, empowered by acknowledging you for who you are and leave here bold to speak your truth to the world. May our leadership be godly influence on a broken world. May we lead through the example of Jesus Christ, leadership that is marked by surrender and submission to your ultimate authority. Dismiss us with your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a reminder, as you exit the sanctuary, uh, please exit up here to my right or to my left and maintain one-way traffic in the worship center. Have a great week. Mm -hmm. Have you been praying and you still have no answers? Have you been pouring out your heart for so many years? Have you been home?